Hello, Podcast Village. So, we're talking about race, and why shouldn't we? You can try to avoid it, but you can't. Welcome to Colorblind, Race Across Generations. We're talking about race in a new way, with open hearts and open minds, and we're not afraid to go there, whatever your there is. I'm your host, Vanessa Eccles, and technical producer, Keith, welcome. Hello, how are you? So what did you think about today's episode? Whoa, boy. (laughs) Yeah, that was a doozy, wasn't it? Today's episode, the title is, Is That Your Kid? We're talking about transracial and transnational adoption, people adopting children of another race. Uh, Boy, we had some raw, honest discussion on this one. Kind of surprised you, Keith, with some of the things that we heard people say. Yeah, that's these are these are real stories by real people, and mm-hmm. that's that's why we're here. That's what it's all about. So if you think it's no big deal, just love the children, and that's enough. Don't stop listening because we have a lot to unpack for you here. So our guest today, uh, Mary Robinson, is an adjunct professor at Valencia College here in the Greater Orlando area, and she has really studied this issue. She is a Korean woman adopted by white parents, and she wrote a thesis on this issue. We also have Mara Belts, who is the Alumni Affairs Director at Bethune-Cookman University. She was also adopted by two white parents. She is part black, part Korean, and we have with us child advocate Penny Jones, who adopted three African-American children. So a very diverse group, uh, women across the generations. We have one in her 30s, one in her 40s, one in her 50s. I will not tell which is which, just in case. I was about to say, you get to guess at home. (laughs) They might find me. But, uh, boy, what an enlightening conversation here. So here is uh, today's episode. Is that your kid? Welcome to our panelist, Mary Robinson. You are Korean, adopted by two white parents. And your thesis, in fact, study this it's called Living a Parallel Life, Memoirs and Research of a Transnational Korean Adoptee. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. Also, we have with us Mara Belts, who is the Alumni Affairs Director at Bethune-Cookman University. Interesting background, uh, black and Korean, yes. adopted by two white parents. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Penny Jones, who is a child advocate, and she is the mother of five children, three adopted African-American children, two girls, ages... Nine you forgot. and <laughs> 11. We just had a series of birthdays. <laughs> okay, nine and 11, and a boy who is... Eight. Eight years old. 23 and 26. And the other two. So <laughs> that's a full house there. I want to get started, panelists, by reading you something taking you back to September of 1972, when the National Association of Black Social Workers issued a position statement on transracial adoption. So you're probably familiar with it, but I have the entire statement here, all four pages. I will not be reading all four pages, but just some highlights here. And I wanna get your reaction to some of the things mentioned in this. Black children in white homes are cut off from the healthy development of themselves as black people. In our society, the developmental needs of black children are significantly different from those of white children. Only a black family can transmit the emotional and sensitive subtleties of perception and reaction essential for a black child's survival in a racist society. A white home is not a suitable placement for black children. It is totally unnecessary. So, Mara, yes. half black, half Korean, adopted by two white parents. When you hear that, it was, not, it was 1972, things mm-hmm. have changed, but yes. when you hear that, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are, I understand exactly where they're coming from, um, when they, especially from 72, um, when that was originally written. But even it's relative to situations today. Yes, I was adopted by white parents, and I turned out okay. I do identify as black. However, um, the needs of a black child are different from the needs of a white child in a racist society, because society still is very racist. And so 
um, just from my own lived experience, I don't believe that my parents could provide me or did provide me all of the necessary emotional and just um, experiential things that myself or my younger brother, who is also adopted black and Korean from Korea, um, that we needed to be able to maneuver through society um, as mixed race, um, black and perceived black, although we were mixed race, um, individuals uh, born in the 80s, you know, now adults. Uh, so I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. I think that it's important for, it happens though, and so because white families still do adopt black children, it's gonna happen. So we can't say you can't do it because there are children out there who need families. But I think that it's necessary and it should be mandatory that white families get educated and get uncomfortable. And they gotta get real uncomfortable. And what do you mean by that? Um, they have to face their own racism because it's there. And whether they want to face it, admit it, um, realize it, uh, the fact is that, like, my parents are baby boomers. And so, I mean, they lived through civil rights. They lived through all of it. And me personally, I'm, I've not asked them what they were doing during the civil rights era because I don't want to know what they were doing during the civil rights era. And I definitely don't want to know what my grandparents were doing. You don't want to ask them in case it was something that would be against everything that I am. That you stand for and believe yes, in. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we've not had that conversation. Um, I do have some aunts that, you know, have told me that they were out there, you know, um, protesting, you know, and things like that. So, I mean, I kind of have a general feeling um, to the open-mindedness of my family be, just for the simple fact that they adopted two minority children. However, the fact is racism is there, in my opinion, in all white people. Um, the fact I did, I work at and I did attend an HBCU and the sole factor in why I chose to go to an HBCU was because I was a transracial or am a transracial adoptee and I had to immerse myself in the culture that I present as because I had no experience. I, had, I did not know what it was to be black. And it's not a way to talk. It's not, you know, the movies that you like. It's not any of that. It's not any of the stereotypes. It's just how you feel about yourself. And I was never around any black people or Korean people. And I still struggle a lot with that half of myself. So you've unpacked a lot that we're going to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to move on to Penny, though, to get your reaction to that statement from 1972. Well, for me, that statement hit home because in the 70s, my family and I, we lived in Ghana, West Africa. There was a little girl that we fell head over heels in love with that the family begged us to bring her back with us to the United States. At that time, the culture was so separated here in the United States my parents didn't think that they could safely bring her back with us. Now, I feel grateful that we've come so far that I, as a blonde Caucasian woman, can adopt three black children and navigate fairly easy. I mean, I still have a lot of things to learn and break down stereotypes of my own or help my children navigate, but my children came older especially my 11-year-old, having lived the first seven years of her life in a black home. So she came to me later in life, and, you know, we just do the best we can. Um, but I'm grateful that our country has come as far. I think we have a lot further to go. But the fact that we can have this conversation and start to break down those barriers, I think is huge. And Mary, as someone who was born in Korea, adopted when you were, was it five? When you hear that statement from the National Association of Black Social Workers, again, it was in 1972, but when you hear some of the concerns they raise, what's your reaction? 
Yeah, so um, that was actually part of my research for my thesis um, because the uh, black social workers were really the first to address this issue of how race would play into adoption um, because the history of uh, transracial adoption, primarily the adopters, the parents, are typically white Caucasian. Um, it is still something... Although it was 1972, and yes, we've made strides, we are still living in a world that is so racially charged and divisive um, based on local, national, international politics of varying degrees. Um, looking at some of our leaders, right, they have made race an issue, whether it's through immigration, whether it's through openly calling for sanctioning of NFL teams, right? Like. Um, it, it is still an issue that has in many ways not progressed. Um, and when I think about what the uh, black social workers were saying in their statement, right, the big problem that I hear from Mara as well that I had is that children need biological mirrors, meaning that they need to see and be um, immersed in s communities where they see people that look like them. So, let, so let's talk about that, because that is a great segue into what I want to get into your personal stories. So when you came from Korea, mm -hmm. got off that plane, and mm -hmm. there were these two white parents waiting for you, mm -hmm. when you got back to Central Florida where you grew up, did you see children who looked like you? No. No. Um, the first school that I went to was St. Margaret Mary on Park Avenue, and you can imagine in 1975 what Winter Park was like, especially on Park Avenue. I was the only person of color at that private school. Um, and in my community in Winter Park, Longwood, Central Florida, Altamont, um, race was not something people talked about. It was not integrated, right? There were definitely black parts of town, Hispanic parts of town, white parts of town. Um, then when I transitioned into um, public school, it was still very few um, children of color because, again, I was in a white community. Um, and 1975, um, we're after Vietnam, right? So the fact that I'm Asian, um, it's a monolithic race. And I would have, you know, grown white men scream in my face that I had, uh, I was responsible for their son being killed in Vietnam. Because they saw you as Asian, thought right. you were Vietnamese. Right. And didn't realize you were Korean. Right. And it didn't matter, right? They just saw that I was Asian. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for children of color particularly, it's important to have what is the term is a biological mirror because otherwise they're constantly reminded that they're the other, that they mm -hmm. don't fit in, particularly for Mara and myself and, and your children, right? When you are out as a family, it's visible that, you, that this you family is out. off. For right? lack of a better way to put right, it. Right, right. Um, and so with in non-transracial adoptions, you wouldn't know unless someone told you, right? Um, now, as an adult, I identify as a transracial adoptee because I'm not with my family. But growing up as a child, it's very present, um, and other people are always the ones um, constantly reminding you of that. No matter how you feel inside, no matter what type of, of ancillary supplemental privilege you may get from your white parents, people will constantly remind you all the time. And so, Mara, I hear your mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so was it a similar experience for you growing up as well? You didn't see, or did you see children who looked like you or kind of looked like you? Sometimes. Sometimes I did. Um, I did have a brother who was also adopted, a younger brother, 15 months younger than me, who came over from Korea as well um, and who is mixed, just like me. People thought we were twins. But culturally, he didn't get any mirroring. So um, both of us were just kind of in the same boat. We mirrored each other, but we didn't marry, mirror our parents. Or our, we have two older brothers who are also white. And, um, and you were adopted at what age? Three months. Okay. Yes. And he was two. So... Um, Going to school, we did have a mixture in, in, of students who were black or Hispanic or white. 
Um, but as far as role models, just because the kids look like you doesn't mean that they that we can relate to them because we're going home to a white environment every single day. Um, and unless we have that kind of had that, I don't know, guidance is the only way I can put it on how, on what it meant to be what we were, um, it didn't, it didn't register for us. So was there an issue of people saying, oh, wait a minute, are those your parents? Oh, all the time. Why are your parents white? All the time. Constantly, and as a so, child, how, do you, how did you deal with that? I mean, as a child, you get, I mean, you just say, Yeah, those are my parents, and then you got to explain everything. And adults, I mean, nobody has people don't have any shame if they want to know, they'll ask whether it's an adult, a kid, um, you know, anybody. And so, they they ask. I mean, I had somebody, I had one per that I mean, people telling you that you're lucky that you're adopted mm-hmm. is is terrible especially to a child who and how is that terrible because i think a lot of people might not understand that when they say oh you're so lucky they came and rescued you exactly so i mean why do you have to be lucky to have parents i mean that's that's crazy for a kid to even try to compute that that you're lucky to have parents um i mean every kid should just have parents you don't have to be lucky to be saved um, I know a lot of adoptees who, regardless of the situation that their birth parents were in, would rather just be with their birth parents. Wow. Yeah. Because that's their original family. I mean, that's their biological family. Do you feel that way, too? I don't know who they are, so I can't sit. No. I mean, I love my parents. They are wonderful, amazing people. I can't imagine anything else but them. Um, But I want to know who my biological parents are. I do. Um, But I don't feel that way because I had a great adoption experience. I had some real crappy adoption experiences as well, Um, you know, with people telling me that I would have been a second-class citizen in Korea because I was black I mean, I had adults tell me that, you know, I would have been living on the street when I was like 10. Somebody at church told me that, um, that I would that I would have been basically a second class citizen living on the street. That has to be emotionally scarring, though, as a 10 year old to hear that from an adult. Oh, absolutely. I never told my parents that Um, I was very protective of my parents as a child. And even now, like, I mean, my parents pretty much don't know anything that people said to me for being adopted because I didn't want them to feel bad. So, Mary, how about you? The the issue of do you ever think how life would be had you stayed with your biological parents? Yeah, so I was in an earlier wave of Korean adoptions. um, And just as a, uh, for context, uh, the Korean adoption um, community is the largest uh, international adoption group in human history, Um, which is good and it's bad, and it all stems from the Korean War. Um, But um, it's bad because current groups of international adoption communities use it as a model, and it was not done well. Um, But for me, I mean, I think that... um, it was hard as well, right? And so when I came over, I was considered a high risk, um, special needs, because I was five years old. Um, I was, when I was done with my intake, I had uh, parasites and lice and malnutrition, and I was half the size that I should have been for a child my age and all this stuff. And so um, was I lucky in a sense, I guess, um, did I have a good, happy adoption experience? Absolutely not. I'm really happy for you, Mara, that you did. Um, but yours was not that. No, it wasn't. Um, and and I don't begrudge anyone that, right? Um, but, yeah, to be told, wow, you were so lucky, or you're the chosen one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that is condescending. Mm-hmm. And, again, to, to Mara's point, right, like every child deserves parents. 
it shouldn't be luck, right? Mm -hmm. Every every child deserves parents. Um, and, you know, particularly in the Korean adoption uh, groups and, and even in the modern day groups of Ethiopia and, and Russia and what have you, um, so many of the parents did them uh, for religious reasons. Um, th there are whole groups of, of communities where uh, as a church group, they were like, we've got to save these brown babies. And they did. Um, my parents were definitely one of those. Um, but it's, it's hard to grow up in, as a child and be thrown all these things at you. I mean, I would get questions like, you know, well, where are your real parents? Mm -hmm. Don't you want to know your real parents? Um, in front of me, adults would ask my, my parents, well, how much did she cost? With you standing right yeah, here. Yeah, right? Like, um, and how, do, how did they answer that question? They would answer. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, you know. It, I wasn't expecting to hear that. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and so, and I talk about my thesis, right, and it's a huge problem, and this is why um, the adoption industry, because it really is an industry to a great extent, right, um, the commodification and transactional aspect of adoption. I mean, Korean adoptees helped rebuild the economy of South Korea. They could not get us out fast enough, and they were making so much money. Um, and in 1975, my adoption was $20,000. So building inflation for now, and it was a bargain then, um, you know, but it's, it's an industry. Um, and it is hard to hear things like, oh, you're so lucky you were chosen. So Penny, as an adoptive mother, when you hear that, the whole idea of rescuing a child and the children are lucky, what are your thoughts? I feel sad for your experience and of course mine is comp my experience is completely different sometimes in my home I'm the outsider because I adopted three siblings that look exactly alike they act exactly alike and you know I'm constantly asked if I'm their babysitter or their you know that type of thing um, I'm, tr I'm, tr I'm my children came to me with a sense of gratitude. You know, we, we get a lot of questions, but because they witness such horrors uh, and nightmarish experiences in their the home of their biological mom, they have this incredible, they almost like worship me. They are just couldn't be prouder. Now my eight-year-old little boy now, when I go on a field trip, he'll be a little embarrassed, like shh. You know, mom but embarrassed because I'm white but yet he's the only one that sits with me on the bus <laughs> but you know we get a lot of questions but they're pretty they're pretty proud of where we've come and what we've come through to become this family um, but I do I do feel the differences in our community when I go anywhere I we went to DC over spring break it's very time consuming to have children that don't match you because you spend a lot of time saying they're with me they're with me so i went and got us all t-shirts that matched jones one jones two jones three and jones four so at least when we were in public it wasn't quite as much just trying to tell them they're with me if you go to a magic game every few feet someone was asking my little boy where's your parent where's your parent um any points to you like well there she is there she is there and he, you know like standing right here beside yeah. me my nine-year-old she doesn't see it uh, she joined the family at two was reunified with her biological mom for after two and a half years for three months and then came back so she had just enough taste of the reunification that in her mind I've always been her mommy and I will always be her mommy and so I'm grateful to be able to have them and love them. But, you know, I feel discrimination too. As a white mom, you know, I believe, I pray, God will bring me whoever I'm supposed to have. I did not go out and recruit three black children to adopt. God brought them to me, I believe. And so I just do the best I can. And discrimination goes both ways. You know, I, I get it whenever I make sure when we go out in public that their hair looks good. 
or else we get stopped a lot with people trying to tell me how to do their hair or if they don't have enough lotion on their skin am I taking care of them properly or are they getting am I too soft on them because there's a cultural thing with discipline that I get that kickback that maybe I'm not stern enough I'm too soft but what they don't understand is my children are I've been through all the behavioralists and all the trauma therapies in the in Seminole County and I've learned how to parent this sibling group but people don't understand people judge they see they think they make their own assumptions and we just have to live with it and know what's true in our heart and love each other unconditionally so let's talk about four families that have transracial or transnational adoptions how do you talk about race in the family um, Mary did your parents talk to you about what it means to be a Korean child or about your culture and your heritage? Or were you just simply raised as a white girl in America? Yeah, so the latter. I was raised as a white girl. Uh, once a year, they would take me out to celebrate my adoption day, uh, the day that I came over to the States. Some adoptee families call it um, gotcha day. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly care for that myself. Um, I, I prefer family Mara, day. Mara, you're shaking your head. You'd heard that term. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. yeah. I prefer adoption day or, or family day. Um, but once a year, they would take me on my adoption day for Chinese food. Oh, you're no. not Chinese. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Um, but it's Asian. So. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, but I, I will say, you know, to, uh, to some of my parents' credit, you know, 1975, we did not have the technology or the availability of resources that we do now. Could they have taken some time maybe for books or what have you? Absolutely. Would there have been much? No, but they could have found stuff. Um, so I think that that is a real plus for families now, transracial families, uh, that the resources are so available. But they never talked to me about um, my identity as being Korean. They never talked about Korea to me. Um, and, you know, your parents were baby boomers. Mine were, um, you know, born in 1928 and 1929. They were older to begin with. Um, a lot of times parents are older, uh, or historically they were when they adopted, um, particularly in my group. And so um, I grew up hearing the N-word. I grew up hearing the, the um, slurs for Jewish people, for Hispanic people. You know, um, and in the home, you mean? Yes. And as a child of color, um, it makes you think inwardly, like, well, if you feel that way about other people of color, how do you truly feel about me, right? Um, so that was difficult because I recognized that my parents were racist. And here I am, you know? Um, and but you know those, there will be those who will look at that and say, there's no way your parents could be racist because they adopted you. Right, right. Um, and to them, I would say, that's what you can believe, but you didn't grow up in my home. You don't know the extent of what um, I heard and witnessed um, and experienced. And it is racist whether they adopted me or not, right? Lots of racist people do things that seemingly seem nice, um, and, you know, for the majority of, of racists, they don't wear uh, the, the robe and the hood, right? So, um, yeah. <laughs> and so, Mara, in your house, did you talk about race? Did you talk about, here we are, these two white people, but your skin is brown, and so is your brother's? And right. No, we didn't have conversations about it. Um, the funny thing that my parents did, and I, I agree that, uh, you know, the, in the 80s and in the 90s, there wasn't as much out there as there is today, but there was, there were things, and they didn't look for those things. Yes, uh, but so what my parents did, and I laugh at it now, at the time it was kind of traumatizing, um, but what my parents did is my parents would take my brother and I, and they would put us in black daycares or black after school programs. And I mean, the cultural differences were vast. Um, you know, we were used to a certain, you know, leeway, say, in our white household versus some, some corporal punishment that was acceptable in, in uh, the black daycares and things like that. And the thing with the black daycares is we were there for like two hours. 
not, we were at home with our family all the rest of the time. So, I mean, the the culture shock there was was terrible for us, especially as young children. So it kind of trained us to really be scared of those experiences because that, to my parents, that was a black experience. It was, okay, we're gonna take you over here to the black area in Denver, that's where I'm from, and we're gonna put you in this after school program. And then we'll just pick you up and so you'll get this two hours of what we think is a black experience. And that's how we'll give you some. But they never talk to you about what it means to be a black child in America. No. no. Not at all. What do you wish they had done as an adult now looking back? I wish that they had um, given us some racial mirrors, mentors. Ultimately, that's the only, th I mean, not, uh, not the only, but that's a major impact that could have been um, placed into our lives because they couldn't have done it. Yes, conversations could have been have and I d had, and I do wish they would have done that and just really kind of just asked what we were feeling and what we were confused about. But ultimately, I mean, a white woman couldn't teach me how to be a black woman and how to maneuver as a black woman amongst white and black women. She just can't do that because she didn't live the experience. And that's nothing against my mother. But it's just like, she didn't live the experience and I'm about to live the experience. So I need somebody else who's lived the experience. And so Penny, what are you doing with your children in terms of making sure they understand or know the culture? Well, we do, I try to embrace every experience that comes before me. You know, I'm lucky to be raising them here in the year of 2018 and we have a whole month set aside at least to study African-American history and culture. I, um, you know, I. In our school, we're blessed that there's a variety of cultures. Their best friends are all races and all colors. And they've had teachers of all races, all colors. Um, we participate in everything I can from walking the MLK parade here in, in, down in Orlando. We went to DC and immersed ourselves in the National Museum of African American Culture. My children are little sponges and my nine-year-old studies Harriet Tubman. She just idolizes her. Um, I still don't think we have a long way to go. They still don't understand what discrimination is. I'll never forget the first time I took her to see a movie where it was a parent, um, and she didn't understand the difference, why that people would treat someone with brown skin differently than white. And when she realized it, she cr crawled up into my seat in the movie theater just curled up like a little kitten and um, there's still we still have a ways to go but they're also there's a sense of purity in them right now that they don't see it at this point and I you know I'm I try to educate them and immerse them in different cultures not only just African-American history but we try to learn about other cultures like say one night a week, we'll go out and eat a different type of food and try and ask questions about the culture or try and learn about other races other than our own. Um, but, you know, at this point, we've still, we still have a ways to go. I, you know, for me, I, I worry, what worried me the most was the whole Black Lives Matter because I have an angry little eight-year-old boy that can flip into rage in the blink of an eye. So I got him a sheriff mentor because I was afraid. I didn't know what to do because I don't know how to explain to him. But, and, but for me, one of the things that made me the most nervous was traveling to Tennessee with three little black children and driving through Georgia and some of the areas where it's not real common to see a blonde woman with three little black children and everyone said, just drive careful. And I had my adoption certificates and maybe I was paranoid, but I'd rather be paranoid and well, be pro proactive. Mara is shaking her head. No, you weren't being paranoid. Not at all. You weren't. Yes. Yeah, you have to do that. You have to travel with the papers. You have to be hyper vigilant, <laughs> and and it's important. Like I appreciate you saying that they have a sense of purity, which they do. They're kids, and kids yeah. don't. They're taught racism. Um, but so black children growing up with black parents, they grow up knowing about racism because their parents experienced it. Mm -hmm. And so they they grow up knowing that, especially young boys, 
knowing that, hey, someday a white man or a white woman is going to say the N-word to you and they're going to mean it. And they're going to do these things to you. So you've got to be prepared in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And so your children are growing up with this purity, as you said, not understanding that it's going to happen to them someday, especially down here. Um, and and to believe that it's not going to happen to them oh, no. is, is naive. No, I'm not saying it's not going to happen to them. Do you think you're prepared for that? I think that, well, you also have to take for granted that we, we've had a lot of healing just to get to this purity yeah, state, no, you know, I because they that. came from a very traumatic yeah. experience with their biological mom who was black. And so they they have a sense of trauma, yeah. and, you know, that I have to deal with, you know. So getting them to that pure state was an accomplishment, but no, um, they, I mean, they will call me out. If I, even certain things, if I start to tell them, come on, you guys got to get some lotion on your skin. We're going to go hang out with this family that may not, you know, we have friends that are of all races. And I said, um, you know, my little girl's got some ashy skin. <laughs> and let's get, let's all take care of our skin before we go out. And, oh, you're being racist. <laughs> so they're quick to call me a racist all the time. Um, if I, if I, you know, and I, I'm not saying I know everything, um, but I think we're, we're getting to the point, and I try to bring it into the conversations. Um, but right now, they're still maybe in the, the pink the pink cloud per se. They're so grateful to be safe because mm -hmm. I've only I only adopted them three years ago. Okay. So gotcha. so they were older. Mm -hmm. So they experienced both cultures. So especially my 11 year old, she remembers it vividly. And so. But are you prepared for the day when one comes home and has had an experience? where they've been called the N-word or they've been bullied because of race? Timothy, most recently, he, um, he didn't want to get on the bus. And I said, well, why? Well, there's this boy, he's, a, he's mean, and he says that I'm so dark people can't see me at night. And I said, well, what did you do? We should tell the bus, you know, we should call them out because we have a zero tolerance, blackout bullying is really a big deal at school. Oh, we took care of it. This happened like two months ago. And we went and reported to the assistant principal. I said, well, you need to do it again. If, you know, they, they have a strong character and they aren't afraid to stand up for themselves. Have they been called the N-word yet? No. But they have been, you know, they have been, I think they're pretty strong in character. But, um, but they're still little. They're still in elementary school. They haven't been called the N-word that you know of. That I know right. of. You know, but they, they're pretty good at protecting each other. They're strong. They're like... They're like a little army sometimes. I see them go off and they are, I, I'm, I'm pretty encouraged by their character and um, knowing right from wrong and calling people out. Um, can, can I ask a question? Okay, uh -huh. so, so how about a situation where they are treated differently by their teachers and it appears that it's because they're black? So, for example, they're being labeled a problem child because they're, I mean, and it happens a lot. So maybe they're more rambunctious or they're just a rambunctious kid, right? But now they're being singled out in class because of this. Mm -hmm. But there's a white kid who's also rambunctious in class. But now your kid's getting sent to the principal's office or getting in trouble um, for this. And it appears like it's a race issue. It happens all the time. So I'm just wondering, like situations like that, like how would you or, or handle that? Or, well, because it's not always like with the kids, especially yeah. in school. Now, Timothy always has had issues in school because of some think he's ADD, some think it's this or that, and whether it be race or not, um, when teachers are, some teachers have a hard time with him and redirecting him to, you know, he's very smart in the right direction could be a challenge. So in kindergarten, he was just kindergarten, he's a bright little boy. He had an elderly Caucasian teacher that he was driving crazy. And I knew that it was just a, I don't, I didn't really assume that it was the race, but, and I had to have those conversations with the, the guidance team and say, um, he needs a teacher that's more, more suited for him. 
and we got him with a younger teacher with a, that had a more open character, I would say. It was younger and easier to redirect a, a child of his needs, and he excelled. Last year, he was with a teacher that found him annoying, and he backslid. But I didn't want to be that parent that's always fighting his battles for him. This year, he's with a great teacher, and he's on the AB Honor Roll. So I'm ready to go in. If I saw any discrimination, without doubt, I would go to the principal, I'd go to the school board if I have to. Um, you know, I, I look at it more through a trauma-informed education filter, but you've opened my eyes to maybe it is a discrimination. I, I would be more concerned not in school, right, because it is more of a controlled environment. I would be more concerned when you are not with your children, um, male or female, um, because of police issues. Um, and non-police issues as well, right? Whether it's service at a restaurant, being followed at a store. I mean, two years ago, I was followed around at a Ross near the airport by security every minute I was there. And I was like, I, I don't even want anything. I'm killing time to pick someone up from the airport, right? Um, and so that's what I would be more concerned about because it's the non-controlled environment. Um, particularly as your sons get bigger mm -hmm. and taller, right? They may pull out a Kit Kat from their pocket and someone thinks it's a knife or a, a, a gun. Yeah, right? and that's probably my greatest concern right there. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would be more concerned about. And it's unfortunate that at some point, if you haven't already, you're going to have to have that conversation with your black children of how to conduct themselves in public in non-controlled situations because that is where the true danger will lie for sure yeah. but um, that's that's one of the issues how do parents who are white talk about that kind of issue with children of color because they haven't experienced it i was talking to someone today and i said yeah we'll talk about uh, parents having the talk and he's like the sex talk and i was like mm, no the talk he had no idea what i was talking about and i said well ask any person of color and they know the talk is about how to handle yourself with police, but how to handle yourself in public so that you don't come off looking suspicious, angry, scary, blah, blah, blah. Right, right. And, and I think, um, so I've seen stuff on social media that I've posted to my own accounts and what have you, right? It's never too young to talk to children mm -hmm. about race. Yep. Um, and you start, there's great books now that are available that make it very accessible on um, in the educational level of young children. Um, I think it's also important when things happen in the news, right, that you talk about it with your children and say... Oh, there's a lot to talk about <laughs> these days. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, particularly when so many of the things are intersecting, right? Um, uh, I think about Colin Kaepernick because he is a black man who was adopted by white women. Um, when the controversy with him first broke out, people said, well, he can't complain. His parents are white, right? And it's like, well, that... He's not white. He doesn't get to put on, you know, white skin all of a sudden. The privilege doesn't extend when they're not with him. Um, but, you know, having those moments like that and talking to, particularly if it's not a violent incident, mm -hmm. but it's so public and, and, and prominent, talking with your, your children of color about that, you know, asking them what they think. Have them read it with you. You know, look at the news clips. Um, ask them what hurts them. Right, because I, I'm not going to speak for all people of color, but for myself as a person of color, when something like that happens, and particularly if it's in the adoption community uh, with people of color, it hurts me. Right, it affects me, um, and and asking and letting them know it's okay to have emotion about it, whether they're angry or it hurts them or they're sad or you know, um, just having those conversations and and not negating it or not even talking about it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, when you were growing <coughs> up, Mary, in your house, um, when there were instances when you were discriminated against or called names, was your home an environment where you felt comfortable going to your parents to say, this happened to me? No, no. And there was a sense of, um, I couldn't, right? Um, I couldn't, in fact, I didn't dive into this whole adoption um, experience and how it affected me and the trauma and the therapy and everything until um, after both my parents were deceased. And that tends to be very um, 
normal time for adoptees when their parents are deceased that they can really dive into things more and be more open about it. Because there is this sense of, I don't want to hurt them, I want to protect them. Um, deep down, although I hate, you know, feel grateful you're chosen, I do feel grateful and I don't want them to feel that I'm not grateful. Um, you know, because the flip side is I don't know what my life would have been and I have a great life now. Um, and that is something to be grateful for, but, and they wouldn't have understood. <laughs> there was that aspect of it too. Um, they would not have understood. Um, and they would have said, oh, you're being sensitive. Um, it, the few times I did bring it up, they're like, oh, you're American. That's what you are. You're as American as apple pie. And I'm like, but I'm not, you know. Um, and it's hard to talk to people that don't want to listen. And you felt they didn't really want to no. listen. How about you, Mara? Was that a conversation you were comfortable as in a child having with your parents about discrimination, being called names, the crazy questions? Mm -mm. No, and for me, it was, I didn't, I didn't want my parents to feel, I was protective of them. I didn't want them to feel bad that about anything and I guess and I I don't know in my little young brain I just felt like if I told them that people were being mean about the adoption or anything that it would hurt them and I didn't want them to be hurt so I just took it all I took it all I I did not share one thing one mean thing that people said about the and I'm sure people said stuff to them I have no idea what it was because I'm sure they were protecting me but on the flip side of that, I was protecting them because I didn't tell them what the kids said to me, what the adults said to me, and I just, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to. So is that a conversation you would feel comfortable now having as an adult, or well, does it not matter now? Uh, it still matters. It's, we've had some small conversations, um, and the thing is, I know that they would be open to it, but part of me still feels like I don't know. I just want I just want them to to not have to worry. I don't want them to have to worry about that. I don't want them to feel bad, especially like if they felt like they should have protected me more or anything. I just don't want them to have to deal with that. So I just I just leave it alone. Can I add one thing too? Absolutely. I think also as a child. Um, and you and your brother were both adopted from Korea, is that mm -hmm. correct? Um, as a transnational, transracial um, adopted child, there was very much this sense of, I wanted to present as very good and not a problem, yes. right? Because there is this real fear that I had, that I'm sure other adoptees have had, that they will be sent back, mm -hmm. right? Correct. Because, um, and more and more psychological research is showing that um, all adoptees have PTSD. Um, and when you are relinquished, abandoned, what, whatever word you want to put on it, right, um, there is this, this sense for me anyway, and again, I'm not going to speak for all adoptees, but there is, was this sense that um, at any moment my situation could change again to where I would be given up yet again, mm -hmm. right, that mm -hmm. I didn't deserve to be there in the first place because somebody had already given me up, right? Because you're talking a young child. Yeah. Um, logic doesn't figure into thinking as a young child. It's very rare. It's, it's much more emotional and feeling. And um, there was this sense of impermanency mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, at any moment um, it would end. So I think that that for me was a factor too. Yeah. At what point did you embrace being a Korean woman, Mary? Um, gosh, 2012, 2011, maybe 2010. So fully, a full-fledged adult. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And was there some kind of defining moment, or did you just grow into it as you got older, or what was it? So I have to say I was really fortunate that my partner is very open and um, I mean I had Korean food for the first time with him because he was like let's try Korean food I'm like all right um, and then <laughs> my child also you know how crazy that sounds because <laughs> it's like wait a minute she's Korean okay <laughs> right. but but I grew up as white 
Mm-hmm. Right? Inside, I still feel white. Um, I don't know that I'll ever feel Korean, but I'm embracing being Korean. Um, I had I did not meet another Korean adoptee for the first time until um, 2012. Wow. First time in my life. Again, as a full-fledged adult. Right. And then social media, being the dawn that it is, found all these groups and everything. Um, you know, and really started to... Um, dive more into that part of myself and my identity and I think some of it comes with age right being more comfortable in your skin not giving a crap what other people think um, not being apologetic and also because my daughter is half Korean right she's half Korean half white trying to model behavior for her for her to be proud of who she is uh, uh, both parts of her culture Mm -hmm. cultural um, heritage um, so I think that was really important for me, and um, yeah, so. And so, Mara, how about you? Because you mentioned that you went to um, HBCU. HBCU. Yep. So me, I identify as black, a black woman, but I and, still. And when did you start identifying? As, do, you, do you remember? Is like, well, I'm a black child. I oh, mean, yeah. Um, well, I always said that I was black, like, because I constantly got asked, well, what are you, you know? throughout my whole life so I always said I was black and Korean because that's what I am but I didn't really understand what that was because you asked um what you were raised I was raised as a white girl too I mean I was raised as a little white girl um my mom chopped all my hair off she didn't know what to do with it she didn't know how to do a mixed girl's hair so she cut it off she did and the that's wrong a, thing it sounds kind of funny but that's a big big issue it's a huge in transracial issue I was, before i came out here i actually told one of my coworkers that um i destroyed a lot of my young child pictures because i just my self-esteem was low low growing up um but yeah she just my mom did not know what to do and I would say it's less of discrimination. It's cultural, because I know that you mentioned that. But it's, um, and I know I'm kind of digressing from the question, but it's it's super cultural. Black hair is just it's important. It's important. It's very. Important. It's important. Um, and my mom didn't understand that, so she cut off all my hair because it was easier for her, and she failed to understand it wasn't about her about me and my experience and so my I just I was this little girl walking around with this just little short my hair was probably about that long about two three inches long and I looked like a little boy and just a mess and so at what point did you say okay when I can get away from here I'm going to fully embrace my blackness so I was a problem child um, a problem teen more so than your normal teenage angst I was I was my our me and my brothers or my brother and I as teenage year I mean it was World War three in our household uh, he lived in a hospital for a year away um, there were suicide attempts not on my behalf but his drugs alcohol just a lot of problems um, in our teenage years but I me and God had a conversation and my parents gave an ultimatum, you got to go to school or you're out. And so I finally found, I went to three different high schools. The last one stuck and um, didn't know if I was going to go to college or not. Didn't really have a plan. But then finally I just was like, okay, well, I'll go. Um, so I did a year in Denver part-time and then I got a boyfriend who was black. That was my first experience with anything black. And they, his, his grandma did Sunday dinner every Sunday. Um, it was the first time I'd ever had fried chicken. I mean, it was the whole experience. And he was like pro-black black. And um, after that, like, small look into like a black family, a strong black family, I was like, I got to go experience black all the way black so I was like mom I'm going to an HBCU that's it and um, my parents were super supportive of it um, they couldn't have been more supportive so we took an HBCU tour like I decided that probably in April or May that I was going to go to an HBCU 
we did an HBCU tour that summer. I enrolled in Bethune and was gone in August. And culture shock when you got oh, here. Major, like I'm surrounded by all these black people. Major culture shock. <laughs> Mary's Major laughing, but you know, you know what I mean? Like, shock. now I have gone from an environment where I am the only to now I'm surrounded by all these mm-hmm. people who look like me. Mm-hmm. Major, man, I learned so much about weave. <laughs> it was amazing. Speaking of hair again. Yeah. Oh, I, everybody wanted to do my hair. I was in heaven. Um, but uh, it was, I was very apprehensive, though, because my experience growing up is that black kids were so mean to me. I was bullied heavily, heavily bullied, and it was by black kids because I was an Oreo. The few that you saw. Yeah. I, well, I actually went to an all-black middle school. Okay. Because it was, it was, I, it was a performing arts school, but it was mixed in with a black inner city middle school, and they bust in white kids to go to a performing arts school. It was like the fame school, but then it was mixed in with the public. So I went to an all black inner city middle school and I was bullied bad. Cause my hair, enough, right? oh, not at all. My hair was always a mess cause I didn't know how to do my hair. Um, yeah, I talked white, you know, I didn't listen to the same music, you know, it, I did white stuff. My activities were white. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was a very segregated school and I was part of the white side. So it was not acceptable. And so I was apprehensive to attend an HBCU because I was just like, I don't know if they're going to accept you. me. But they did. And I loved it because all black isn't the same. And Just like what Mary was saying, all Asian is it's not the same. Yeah, the first time I went to Korea, which was 2014, um, yeah, it was like, well, everybody looks like me. Yeah. This is crazy. Um, but I wasn't Asian enough. I was too yeah. tan. I weighed too much, I didn't wear enough makeup, you know, I didn't dress nice enough, um, my English was too good. Um, so yeah, you get it from both sides because you are navigating, right, in, in these two very different racial worlds and mm-hmm. cultural worlds. Um, and it's hard because you're not enough for either of them yeah, at that, all. Yeah, and that's the thing because I'm still mixed. Mm-hmm. So it's still, but it was, I mean, I still get it from black people because I'm mixed, but I can deal with that. As an adult. Yes. As an adult, I can deal with that, um, with the mixed comments. So, Mary, if you could give advice to uh, parents out there who have adopted children of another race, what would you say to them? Um, I would say be really patient. Get the resources that you can online. Find communities to engage your children with a mentor that mirrors who they are physically, that can teach them about their culture. If they are an international adoptee, as well as uh, transracial, help them preserve their language. That's really important, uh, particularly when, not sometimes if, but when student, when they go back to their birth country to um, just learn more about it or do a family birth search, right? Language is a big issue, and it also connects people to culture. Um, Find a good therapist because adoption is trauma and things will happen. Um, to your point about your, your brother in the teen years, right? Um, adopted children will diverge in, in one of two paths oftentimes. And again, I'm generalizing, but this has been found in research. They're either incredibly rebellious, drugs, promiscuity, all those things, or they try and be the superstar athlete, straight A's, never gets in trouble. Right. Um, so be patient and, and just be open minded and open hearted um, and get your children the resources because it's it's hard for them. And, you, and it, it will be virtually impossible for you to understand what they're going through because they haven't had the experience. Right. Marl, what advice would you give to a parent? Out um, I echo um, pretty much everything that you said, but also, I mean, I think the mirrors are huge getting those racial mirrors and those mentors that can last a lifetime um, and uh, move. Move to a community that is diverse and that, again, has those mirrors for them, that has a school that 
not only the students are diverse, but the teachers are diverse. Because that, I mean, the teacher, the black teacher is probably going to put more effort into the black child than the white teacher is, nine out of ten times. Um, the white teacher is just going to be like, eh, they're just bad or they're just whatever. And the black teacher is going to take the time to find out what's going on with the child. Um, but moving is huge. Because most white people live in white areas. And then your kid is the other constantly, constantly. Uh, my parents moved, and and it was helpful for us. We didn't live in a, I mean, we still lived in an all-white neighborhood, but we were closer to a diverse neighborhood, and it put us in schools that were diverse. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much everything that you said, I think the therapist is good, the mirrors are good, move, move, move is, is huge. Um, and, and, I mean, at, it's hard to not be defensive when other people, you gotta be open to the advice of, of people who have the lived experience, which are the adult adoptees. I think that oftentimes, um, like people just think about the children, like, oh, the children, they're so cute and they're young and they're fun and that's it. And adult adoptees are very much dismissed. Um, and it's, oh, they're ungrateful, oh, they're just, you know, jaded, they're this, they're that. Um, but we lived the experience. And it's not that everything was so terrible and everything was so bad, but everything's not lollipops and gumdrops either. That's everybody's life, though, whether you're adopted or not. However, there are additional challenges to adoption and then there are additional challenges to transracial adoption. And then there are additional challenges to international adoption. And then if your kid is mixed, you know, there's just so many layers. So um, people who have lived the experience, it, your first reaction is always to just go on the defensive. But you've got to allow yourself to get very uncomfortable and listen with open eyes and open mi mind and open heart um, and and consider a different way. And so, Penny, as an adoptive mother, when you hear these two women talk about some of the challenges, what are you thinking? I'm thinking I'm grateful for your statement of what hurts you. That may be in my, you know, when we're we're dealing with an issue, that will be in our our daily conversation or whenever it, we need it. I think a loving conversation, addressing the issues, and talking about what they're facing on a daily basis and maybe being more, more proactive and asking them, uh, you know, bringing it up more proactively. And um, I want to thank you for these conversations because I will go home and be more open. I'm lucky I live in a diverse community and my, my children have a diverse um, group of friends and, but they don't have mentors and maybe, maybe that's something we need to explore as well. Um, but um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the perspectives I've gotten from each of you. And um, I'm going to try and do better with my three. So what do you think, uh, which, is there a way to sum up like your biggest challenge you feel at this point as being the parent of three children who don't look like you? You've brought up some interesting incidents that have happened, but if you could sum up like what's like the big... For me, the biggest fear, the biggest challenge, I think I've gotten through a lot of the, the cosmetic or the friends, the group of friends, and uh, they're strong, children with strong character that have gone through trauma therapy. So we already had that. For me, it's protecting them from the unknown of when something went, you know, protect, how do I teach them about law enforcement? How do I teach them that aspect? I tried to get a law enforcement mentor. Not sure that it really happened the way I wanted it to that you know I was hoping that he would they would have that kind of bond where he would explain it but I still need to find what's next because I don't think I'm afraid that someday they could be in harm's way just by their color and you know there's there are conversations we have that we have minimally at this point because I don't want to to reopen any trauma wounds for them but um, there are conversations we have to have because I have one starting middle school next year and middle school is a brutal time and phase for children. So, yeah. so I think it's 
loving conversations on a daily basis in our home to talk about what they're seeing, what they're addressing, and how they might help those around them. We also participate in an ad adoption support group. So it's a monthly support group for families that are have adopted. And you know, the parents go in one room, the kids go in one room, and we talk about the issues that we've that we've encountered on a weekly basis, so or monthly basis. Well, thank you, all three. Before we close, though, for each episode, I have the guests answer a question. So we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, the question is you complete the sentence. When it comes to race, I admit. So we'll hear what you have to say when we come back. Hey, technical producer Keith. Hello. We're on Instagram. What? We're on Twitter. All right. We're on Facebook. All right. We're everywhere. What is what is Facebook? Oh, here we go again. So we're in all of these places on social media and Podcast Village. We need for you to connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. All three of them. At once. Right now. Welcome back, Podcast Village. So our panelists... As we close, I ask each of you this question. When it comes to race, I admit. We'll start with Mara. Who now has a shocked look <laughs> on her face. <laughs> when it comes to race, I admit. Oh, man. When it comes to race, I admit that I am very confused about my own personal journey. Wow. Still learning. Still learning. Penny, when it comes to race, I admit. I still have a lot to learn. I still have a lot of cultural issues that I need to learn and embrace and bring into my home. And Mary, since you have studied this issue and lived this issue, when it comes to race, I admit. I still have a lot to learn for sure. And I still need to continue to be a better ally. I consider myself an ally with other people of color, but I can always do better. Always. Well, this has been a very interesting, eye-opening discussion. We could probably go on for another 10 to 12 hours, but we don't have that time. Uh, so thanks to all three of you for joining us and for having a very open and honest conversation. And So that's really what this podcast is about, just getting people to um, look at these issues and not be afraid to talk about them. So I hope this conversation has sparked a conversation for the Podcast Village that maybe people will start talking about these issues. So thank you again. Podcast Village, thank you for joining us for another episode of Colorblind Race Across Generations. That was quite a conversation, Keith. Absolutely. I, I dare you to try to find that somewhere else. You can't. It was unique. It was honest. It was open. And that's what we're striving for. But I will admit, some of the stuff they said shocked me. It was like, oh, you really said that. You can find us in iTunes, in your podcast app. It's not hard to find us. Just make a little bit of effort, people. <laughs> we, people are like, where can I find you? I'm like, okay. I sense, I sense the frustration in yes, your voice. Yes, because they say, I don't have iTunes. Well, I'm like, you have a podcast app. People don't realize that they can have a free podcast app on their phone. Yeah, we, we've, got, we've got some information on the, on, the web, on the Facebook or something, I'm sure, that will help you out. Anyway, you can find us. So tell your friends and your family. Tell even the people you don't like. And by the way, we want to hear your ideas. If you have topics you want us to discuss, leave us a comment in iTunes or connect with us on social media. So again, thank you for joining us for Colorblind Race Across Generations. See ya. Goodbye.